Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, the IDF launched a major anti-terror campaign in an effort to finally root out extremist cells that have been illegally operating in Jenin. Israeli forces sent a series of airstrikes into the Arab stronghold earlier in the week, killing several terrorists. The campaign comes just days after a string of attacks carried out by Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, which harmed civilians and IDF soldiers. The IDF says that they dismantled a joint war room, which a number of armed groups in the city were sharing. Terror cells were using the facility to plan attacks, debrief after missions, and to store weapons and explosives. A senior Israeli official said that the goal of the extensive operation is to end Janine's role as a city of refuge for terror. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that the IDF destroyed several laboratories which were used for making explosives and said that the facilities were operating at full scale. The Hezbollah terror organization moved one of its tents from Israeli territory back across the border into Lebanon, but there are still more structures on the Israeli side that need to be dismantled. In mid-June, Israel discovered that 10 Hezbollah fighters had infiltrated its northern border and set up a small armed military position. Since then, the Israeli Defense Forces have been engaged in diplomatic efforts to convince Hezbollah to withdraw the tents. The terror group's political wing said they would not remove two of their tents and insisted the area is within Lebanon's boundary. The IDF is working with UNIFIL, the United Nations interim peacekeeping force in Lebanon, in an effort to resolve the standoff. Israel is relying on diplomacy instead of military action to get the structures off its land. However, the Iranian-backed militia threatened to go to war if Israel tries to destroy the tents. Israel's intelligence agency, the Mossad, has released details of a recent operation inside Iran to capture the suspected leader of a hit squad planning to target Israelis in Cyprus. The terror plot was stopped by Israeli, Cypriot, and U.S. intelligence agencies who worked together to prevent what could have been a deadly catastrophe. The top spy agency says that they captured an individual who provided a detailed confession about his orders from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. The disclosure of this operation by Israeli intelligence aims to expose the threat posed by Iran, which extends far beyond its rogue nuclear program and includes activities like targeted assassinations. The captured suspect, seen in a video released by Israeli authorities, describes his plan to carry out an attack on Jews in Cyprus and his subsequent escape to Iran. Mossad's statement emphasizes its commitment to targeting individuals involved in terrorism against Jews and Israelis worldwide, even within Iranian territory. Israel's President Isaac Herzog is scheduled to address a joint session of the United States Congress on July 19th. The visit is part of the 75th anniversary celebration of Israeli statehood. The honor has only been offered to a few Israeli presidents in the past, including Herzog's father, who was the president of Israel more than three decades ago. During the trip, Herzog is also expected to meet with U.S. President Joe Biden at the White House. Israel and the U.S. work closely when it comes to cooperating on security and intelligence in an effort to keep the region stable and safe. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu celebrated America's independence at a July 4th event at the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem last week. Netanyahu praised the United States as Israel's irreplaceable and indispensable ally. Jerusalem's relationship with Washington has become somewhat strained since President Joe Biden continues to refuse to invite Netanyahu to the White House. This is quite unusual since the prime minister has been in office for almost eight months. Nineteen anti-Israel progressive Democrats in the United States Congress sent a letter calling on Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to prevent Israel from joining the visa waiver program. The program would allow Israeli citizens to travel to the United States without a visa and vice versa. The people of Israel want this program to move ahead since it can be difficult and require long waiting periods to get an American visa. Approximately 40 nations around the world are part of the program. Tom Nides, the American ambassador to Israel, is trying to get the program underway before he leaves office. 
Israel is the second most pro-America country in the world, according to a Pew Research poll. The Jewish state comes in second only to Poland. Apparently, Israelis have a more positive view of the United States than even some Americans. 87% of Israelis have a favorable opinion of the U.S., with only Poland surpassing them at 93%. This marks Israel's highest favorability rating since 2000 and represents a slight increase from the previous year. 68% of Israelis say they are confident in America's current leadership when it comes to dealing with international affairs. The majority of Israelis also see the U.S. as contributing to world peace and stability. The Tel Aviv Museum of Art is canceling a conference with Christie's Auction House after it sold jewelry belonging to an Austrian billionaire who essentially made a fortune off of jewels taken from Jews who reluctantly sold their jewelry shops at low prices during the Nazi takeover. Ruby rings and emeralds were offered during the auction for millions of dollars, and they actually were sold. Christie's London Auction House generated more than $200 million, setting an international record. The decision to cancel the event is getting praise from Israeli civil rights groups and Holocaust survivors who criticize Christie's for prioritizing profits over ethics. Christie's has been billing itself as a place for restitution of Jewish gems. However, Israel's human rights group, Sharat Hadin, says the company is, quote, just collaborating with the biggest looters of our nation's property. The organization went on to say it would have been outrageous for a public body in Israel to give a platform to the institution while it profits off those who were murdered or survived the Holocaust. Israel has approved a $3 billion deal to purchase a third squadron of advanced F-35 fighter jets from Lockheed Martin. The agreement is expected to be signed in the coming months and will expand Israel's fleet of F-35s to a total of 75 aircraft. The F-35 is known for its advanced stealth technology and intelligence gathering capabilities. Israel has been using the state-of-the-art fighter jet for combat operations since 2018. Hyenas, have you ever seen any in Israel? Well, Israel's Nature and Parks Authority researcher Ezra Haddad is dedicating years of his life to studying them and has taken a number of photos of these furry creatures. Haddad's research focuses on a phenomenon called alloparenting, where he observes hyena and adult cubs and how they care for younger cubs. According to Haddad, hyenas are misunderstood and thought of as being vicious animals, but his study reveals hyenas actually are very maternal and caring. Cubs from previous litters grow up and become caretakers for their younger siblings, which is actually not so common in other species of animals. And when it comes to striped hyenas, for which there are a few hundred in Israel's center, older sisters do everything except nurse their younger siblings. And then, when the time comes for them to be mothers, they're very adept. Today, hyenas are thriving in Israel, and Haddad says they are playful and have soft, clean fur. Haddad hopes his research will help to conserve the striped hyena population. Israel's under-21 soccer team secured a spot in the European Championship semifinals and is qualified for the Paris Olympics in 2024. It's the first time that the team has made it this far since 1976. Israel and Spain have already qualified and Ukraine is expected to claim the final spot. Israel's youth team has managed a series of impressive performances in recent months, including a dramatic penalty shootout victory over the Republic of Georgia in the quarterfinals. Israel's success in soccer continues following their performance at the World Cup in Argentina, where they secured third place. A huge win for Israel. A team from Hebrew University is using ArchCut 3D technology to gain new insights into ancient rock engravings at Timna National Park, located near Eilat, Israel's most southern city. The ArchCut 3D software was created to assess the incisions of the engravings and examine the surface. The study focuses on the techniques ancient engravers used on hard surfaces, which experts say were previously overlooked. Well, with this new technology, the team was able to identify distinct techniques used in different incisions. The findings have the potential to reshape our understanding of different human cultures and inspire more research and collaborations in the field. 
Israel is planning to send a delegation of 1,000 experts, including more than 100 climate and technology companies, to the COP28 climate conference in Dubai. The country will invest 8 million shekels into preparing teams for the event in hopes that the Jewish state will become a global leader in combating climate change. The conference is scheduled for November 30th and will run until the 12th of December and is expected to attract 80,000 attendees from 198 countries. Last year, Israel had its first ever pavilion at the conference. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Nati Ram. He's the executive director of Heartland of Israel. Nati, thanks for being on the show. Shalom. Thank you for having me. Nati, tell our viewers a little bit about Heartland to Israel. So the Heartland of Israel, it's an initiative we started many years ago, and the idea is to go to the heart of Israel, to the biblical places, to Judea and Samaria, to the Temple Mount, the places that we are most connected. Our history is there, our, our fathers and mothers are there, and to join for forces and to bring also the Gentiles, lovers of Israel, to join us. Our enemies are fighting on Judea and Samaria, the Heartland of Israel, and the Temple Mount, and we will protect those places. You actually have a farm near Shiloh, and a lot of people in the Christian community come to visit you. What is that all about? So after my military service, we were four young boys, and instead of doing some, I don't know, to go to do some money, to do some uh, travel in the world, we decided to continue to do our work for Israel, and we went to the Heartland of Israel, to the first capital, spiritual capital of Israel, Shiloh, uh, where the tabernacle was, where Hannah prayed, and uh, we started a new uh, village, and this is what I'm doing since uh, ever. So what happens there? If someone would come to visit, what would they see? So first they will come to, and to see the place of the tabernacle, to reconnect to our roots, see coins from the second temple town that, the, that we find there, and they will, they will come and see our family, our village, how we start a new village, why we are there, and they will see in their own eyes the profilience of the prophecies. You're also a very accomplished attorney. Uh, you're always in the headlines defending people in Judea and Samaria. Why is that a necessary task? You know, I became an attorney when I was arrested more than 20 times and I didn't have any more money to uh, my attorney. And I was ar arrested only because I moved my mouth and prayed on the Temple Mount. And uh, I decided to be a lawyer myself and to protect real human rights of Jews in their, in their homeland who are not allowed to pray and move uh, freely. So this is something that a lot of our readers don't understand. Uh, the Temple Mount is in Israel's hands, yet Jews and Christians, only Muslims can pray there. Jews and Christians can't. How is that possible? This is a phenomenon, you know, uh, the Temple Mount, Mount Moria, the most holy place on earth that David bought and the temple was there. Uh, there are nine gates who are only Muslims free only. Jews or tourists cannot go in. This is a, when we speak about apartheid and racism and discrimination, you can see it every day on the Temple Mount, the most holy place on earth for us, for the, all the genders, because my house will be called the answer prayer for all the nations, and my brothers and sisters are arrested only because they move their lips or they bow. When Muslims can pray, picnic, and bow over their hundreds of thousands, everything is allowed for them. But for the Jews in their own capital, even when it's in our constitution, to Chok uh, Yisod uh, this place is holy for us and for all the nations, and we are not allowed to go there freely. We are not allowed freedom of religion, freedom of movement. It's one of the biggest crises and unbelievable hypocrisy of the world that speak about human rights and don't speak about the rights of the Jews to pray and move their lips in the most holy place on earth. How does the government of Israel justify this? We have freedom of religion. There's a law that says that anyone of any religion can pray anywhere. So how could they stop Jews and Christians from praying on the Temple Mount? How do they justify it? This is exactly the question I asked the court, the Supreme Court, year after year when radical left organizations are appealing against the March of the Flag, the March of the Parade of the Jerusalem Day. Um, they are appealing not to allow us to go because it's the disorder of the peace, they say. And we are saying, this is our proud parade, this is our flag. How come this court, who is protecting the rights, human rights of every minority, considering even not to allow Jews to march with the flag of Israel? So I don't have a good answer 
for your question, but I can tell you that for thousands of years, when the British man that with the Turkish was here in the Ottoman period, we were not allowed to blow the shofar in the Kotel and in Jerusalem, and still we are in the same situation, and we need all of our brothers, our brothers and sisters in the world to join us in this very, very important fight to bring redemption and to blow the shofar and to allow Jews to, pr to pray freely on the Temple Mount. This is the majority of my time I'm coming back from the court. Uh, I represent hundreds of young girls and boys who are dreaming to go back to Mount Moria and unfortunately are not allowed. You know, we just saw about five, six months ago, the Minister of Interior Security uh, went up on the Temple Mount just for a security uh, status uh, tour. And yet the American ambassador to Israel condemned him for destroying the status quo. Why would Americans not want freedom of religion on Temple Mount? The reality and the situation today on the Temple Mount, the most holy place on earth where, where God chose to put his house, his Shechina on earth in Jerusalem, in Mount Moria, Jews are not allowed to move freely. You go there, it's like, it's very, very dark to see it. Tourists can go, there is a line to, for tourists who can go freely, and Jews are in the side waiting for hours, and they go only for a few minutes with an escort, as you said, with an escort of heavy police. This is discrimination, 2023. The United States don't care, the, the UN don't care, nobody cares, because human rights, it's only an hypocrisy to fight the Jews. When Jews are, uh, human rights of Jews are violated, nobody will fight for that. And this is why we and all our friends from all over the world need to help us to blow the shofar, to bring redemption, to bring Mashiach, and to allow Jews to pray freely on the Temple Mount. Nanti, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? We are now in redemption time. This is the money time, as we said, and we need you to gather with us because my house will be called the house of prayer for all the nation. We need to bring redemption with our own prayer and act. Join us in the heart of Israel in our actions. Thank you, Nati, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Haisod. I'm Sam Grunwerg, World Chairman of Karen Haisod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. The story of the Exodus boat is one of Karen Haisod's most famous operations. Listen to the first-hand testimony of one of the brave women who fulfilled her biblical destiny by coming home. And as the dark clouds gathered over Europe, the door to the land of Israel was not yet open. Under Arab League pressure, the British ruthlessly restricted Jewish immigration. Karen Hayasod, alongside Jews already in the land of Israel, banded together and launched the clandestine naval operation, codenamed Aliyah Bet, to save their brethren from the clutches of Nazi Germany and bring them to Israel. לנסוע בחזרה לפולניה. ההורים שלי החליטו שהם רוצים להגיע לארץ. התחלנו לעבור את כל אירופה לכיוון מרסייל. With careful organization and ingenuity, these brave souls defied the British authorities. Makeshift, rickety boats set sail from ports across Europe, transporting a wretched human cargo of men, women, and children desperately seeking refuge. הגיע יום שאספו אותנו והתחלנו להתקדם. זה לקח אולי יום וחצי עד שאנחנו צעדנו בתוך מרסי. וככה לאט לאט הגענו לאוניית האקזודוס. Upon its arrival to the port of Haifa, the ship was deported back to Europe, thus making it a symbol of the many hardships Jews had to face during the time of Aliyah, immigrating to their historical homeland. Gate 
כמו שאנחנו נסענו, הם נסעו. ואז הגיע היום, ראינו שהאוניות מתחילות להתקרב אלינו, וגם ראינו את חיפה, את האורות כבר. וכולם התחילו לשמוח מאוד שרואים אורות, אבל אני מבינה שהיו אנשים שהבינו שמתחיל קרב וזה. הם התחילו לשחק כדורגל האנגלים עם האונייה. אחד נתן דחיפה ימינה, השני שמאלה, והאונייה התחילה להתפרק כמו לגו. בחיפה הורידו את האנשים, עשו עליהם פליט עם כל הכעס שהיה להם, והעבירו אותנו לאוניות, לשלוש אוניות. זו הייתה אוניית אסירים. הם זרקו את כל התרמילים, אנשים נשארו כמו שעלו, בלי בגדים, בלי שום כלום. Undeterred, the overcrowded, unseaworthy vessels of Ali Abet continued to challenge the blockade. Young Jewish fighters, aided by their non-Jewish sailors, succeeded in bringing more than 70,000 Jews home to the land of their forefathers in more than 100 vessels. עם ישראל צריך להיות כולו בארץ ישראל. זה ראינו בכל הדורות. Those who made it ashore were swiftly smuggled into the future Jewish state by daring activists from Karen Hayesod and elsewhere. Evading capture, the new arrivals were taken to Kibbutzim and other new communities to live as free Jews in their own land, fulfilling the dreams of countless generations before them. doing so, they brought to life Zechariah's prophecy, not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. To this day, Karen Hayesod is helping Jews around the world come home with the help of Jews and non-Jews alike. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayesod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. And now, Shining Light from Israel. Located in the heart of Jerusalem is its most important feature, the Old City. The Old City of Jerusalem is comprised of four different quarters, the Jewish Quarter, the Muslim Quarter, the Christian Quarter, and the Armenian Quarter. And today's episode, we are going to discover all that is offered in the Jewish Quarter. Right in the heart of the Jewish Quarter is this massive square complex known as the Rova. And in the middle of the Rova, you have this beautiful golden menorah. It was designed by an organization known as the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute creates vessels like this that can be used in the temple when it's rebuilt. Now we know the original menorah was made from solid gold. This is not solid gold, it's an alloy, but they did use two and a half pounds of pure gold to create it, which is why it's a kosher vessel to be used in the temple that we'll see being rebuilt in our days. Please God, let's continue as we discover more of the Jewish Quarter. One of the monumental buildings here in the Jewish Quarter is a synagogue known as the Chorva, which you can see behind me, that large white dome building. Now Chorva in Hebrew means something that's ruined. This synagogue clearly doesn't look like it's ruined, but the original one was. Unfortunately, in 1948, it was destroyed by the Jordanians and was only rebuilt in the early 21st century. 
let's discover more of the Jewish Quarter. One of the highlights for many people visiting the Jewish Quarter is coming here to the Roman Cardo, which really has nothing to do with the Jews, but at the same time, it has everything to do with us. The reason behind that is the fact that it was built by Hadrian, who was a wicked emperor of Rome, who destroyed Jerusalem and even renamed it after himself. He called it Elio Capitolina. Along the walls of the Cardo are a series of mosaics that depict what life looked like here in the old city about 1500 years ago. But the mural you can see behind me has one thing that just doesn't fit that time frame. That's right, it's the boy right there with his hat on backwards, a backpack, and a plastic bottle of water. But there's a Jewish girl from 1500 years ago handing him a pomegranate. And what does the pomegranate represent? Well, according to our tradition, there are 613 seeds in the pomegranate, one for each mitzvah. So what she's telling him is that you and I are the same. We might dress differently, but our tradition is the same. Our decisions are based off the ethics and morality that have been handed down through the Jewish people from generation to generation. The Cardo, which was built as the heart of that Roman city, still remains the heart of the Jewish quarter. Here you can see artists from all around Israel presenting their incredible wares. And if you're looking for a memento while visiting Jerusalem, this is the perfect place to make your purchase. The Jewish Quarter isn't just comprised of museums. It's also a living, breathing community of over 600 families. And every now and then, the families living in these homes here want to dig down and make for themselves a basement. In doing so, they'll tend to strike upon some archaeology. And when that happens, voila, a new museum will be created. This is how we discovered one of the most important museums here in the old city, the Burnt House which we know belonged to the Katros family towards the end of the Second Temple period. The Katros family is also mentioned in the Talmud, making this discovery that much more special. And then there's also the Herodian mansions, literally underneath what is the Jewish quarter today. Some of the most magnificent structures from the Second Temple period with incredible mosaics and pillars that date back over 2,000 years ago. When visiting the Jewish Quarter, one must visit the Western Wall, the closest place that we can get to, the Holy of Holies, the place where the temple stood, the holiest place according to Jewish tradition. But we're gonna save the Western Wall for another time. So thanks for tuning in, and the next time you visit the Old City, make sure to spend a day in the Jewish Quarter. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan Elrom reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.